We are currently studying the unit Determinism and Free Will. And of course the overarching questions are, do our choices really matter or do we even make choices at all? Or are there forces at play which determine everything ahead of time? And we only live in an illusion of actually making choices. So that's the overarching issue. I'm going to briefly go over some of the terminology for you again, just as a quick review. The defining concepts in this unit, of course, first of all, is the idea of free will, which means that human choices or volition uh, are authentic, they're valid, and they're real. So when we decide what we're going to have for breakfast, for example, that's a true decision. We actually made that, and we didn't have to. The second concept is determinism. This is the position that free will is non-existent, and uh, there is no compatibility here. In this view, determinism, as hard determinism, says everything is fixed, everything is planned ahead of time as cause and effect, and uh, our choices are only illusions of choices because they've been uh, determined by prior uh, factors, by prior causation. Third uh, is the concept incompatibilism. This view is that determinism and free will cannot be reconciled. So, of course, hard determinism would say uh, this, is, this is true, that uh, determinism is incompatible with free will. On the other end of the spectrum, radical freedom like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, advocated is also incompatible with determinism. They both can't be synthesized or mixed with one another. The uh, fourth term we need to look at, concept, is indeterminism. This is the view that not everything is the result of preceding events or causes and the operation of the laws of nature. There are some things that are determined, but other things are not. And of course, the trick there is, pardon the uh, pun, but the trick there is determining which of those things are Therefore, indeterminism may be understood as uh, soft determinism. Our next concept is compatibilism. This is the position that in some sense deterministic forces are valid and real, but at the same time free will and human volition is also valid and real. So therefore compatibilism would uh, complement or, or blend well with indeterminism. Okay. This view recognizes that free will is authentic, but in a limited sense. You can't just choose anything you want and make it happen. Uh, for example, if you're 5 feet 10 inches tall, you just can't suddenly choose to be 7 feet tall and by your choice make that so. Some things are out of our control. Then our final concept is libertarianism. As I said in class, not to be misunderstood or confused with the libertarian political movement or the libertarian political party. That's a different thing. Libertarianism philosophically, in the context of free will and determinism, upholds the position that determinism is false, that free will and determinism are incompatible, and that individuals may act freely, and that their, their choices truly are free. The difference between libertarianism and other defenses of free will lies in its commitment to incompatibilism. There is no compatibilism in uh, libertarianism whereas in compatibilism or indeterminism, there is. All right, having uh, covered some of the key concepts, let's talk for a few minutes about a couple of the philosophers that I introduced in class the other day, and then we'll look at three new ones that we haven't covered, and then we'll uh, say that we did well, and uh, you'll stop this lecture, and I will look forward to seeing you in class. First, uh, we looked at hard determinism or incompatibilism, as expressed by the position held by Paul Henry Theory, the Baron de Holbach. And I mentioned to you that he lived during the French Enlightenment period, uh, 1700s. He ironically died in 1789, and he actually died just a few months before the 1789 French Revolution. Now, would he have survived anyway? That's a question, because after all, he was an aristocrat and a baron. And uh, they were in the crosshairs of the revolutionaries when uh, the reign of terror began. So anyway, he passed away that same year regardless. 
he needs to be understood first and foremost uh, in terms of his philosophical presuppositions that frame his entire worldview and also lead to the arguments he makes and the conclusions he derives from those arguments. By understanding these, you're better able to understand, analyze, and evaluate his arguments concerning free will and hard determinism. His worldview can be summed up by the following three perspectives, atheism, determinism, and materialism. If you can remember those three concepts, you pretty well captured what Baron de Holbach uh, was, you know, believed in and was presenting. And, and why was he so important? Well, in the Enlightenment era, he holds the status of being the uh, foremost proponent of atheism of his day. Uh, he's a little bit like Anthony Flew was in the 20th century in England. Uh, of course, Anthony Flew went on over time to reject his atheism and become a theist. And uh, it appears that at the time of his death, he was thinking seriously about uh, the claims of Jesus. And uh, there's, there's some interesting evidence that he had a couple of close friends who were who were Christians who had explained a lot of things to him about the evidence for Christ. And we don't know for sure what he ultimately did with that, but we do know that he was really interested in Jesus and the gospel. And uh, this was in a, an, a, a, an open, positive kind of way. So we don't know what the outcome of that was, but the point being, you can hold a viewpoint and be really highly regarded and respected for that view, but, but you can also change that view over time. And that can go both ways. There are people who have believed strongly in God who have rejected that. But the point is, when you hold a viewpoint, it's based upon philosophical presuppositions, for sure. And when you change it, those presuppositions have... So, what is it that Baron de Holbach asserts? Well, to begin, he says that metaphysical reality is an illusion. Spirit and soul, those intangibles of humanity are merely concealed functions of the body. God doesn't exist. Therefore, to view human beings as spiritual beings, as well as physical entities, is utter nonsense. Uh, this is his word for it. Intellectual and moral faculties are merely manifestations of physical properties and functions, such as electrochemical actions and reactions in the brain, or hormonal secretions affecting the body and producing responses which humans erroneously accept as intellectual and moral activity. And of course, this radically affects our understanding of uh, free will and, and choices. Well, let's analyze. If de Holbach is correct in assuming <clears throat> that empirical reality is all there is, then his arguments concerning human essence and nature and concerning human choices and behaviors are strongly bolstered. However, the position he holds is... In fact, logic, reason, and evidence strongly suggest that de Holbach may be wrong in his assumptions. He bases his view on his belief that science, particularly the philosophy of science, which you've heard me refer to as scientism, which is not really science... Uh, at all, it's a philosophical view that, that makes science into a religious perspective, one in which people have faith without proof. So he adopts the scientism viewpoint. He preferred this during the Enlightenment era, and it was becoming more popular, but it was not the consensus by any means. There were a lot of scientists, for example, scientists like Sir Isaac Newton, who were strong believers in God, who based their view of physics and science upon the idea that God has created the universe in a certain way that can be analyzed and understood because it's not... Unfortunately, de Holbach failed to acknowledge or take seriously these other viewpoints from people like Sir Isaac Newton, and he adopts his atheistic, natural, empirical viewpoint and flatly asserts that the only reality is physical and empirical. And that settles the issue. Well, of course, if that's where you begin, that will eliminate a lot of other possibilities. Baron de Holbach also falls prey to a circular fallacy in his attempt to make his case for hard determinism. He argues that since empirical reality is all that exists, and since all human functions are physical, 
All human function may be explained as purely physical since empirical reality is all that exists. Another way of stating this is to say, since non-physical reality is non-existent, non-physical human realities and functions are invalid because non-physical reality is non-existent. Well, you can see the circular nature of his argument, but as you analyze it and evaluate it, you realize he doesn't prove anything. He makes an assertion, and from that assertion, he draws a conclusion, and then he says his conclusion is valid because of his assertion. Well, this doesn't prove anything. This is a, a fallacy in logic, and de Holbach uh, should have known better and should have done a better job. The difficulty here is primarily that of logic and reason. Logic maintains that one cannot prove that a position is valid and true by stating at the outset that it is true, and then concluding the desired position has been effectively proven. Reason, logic, and evidence does not support such a position and methodology. So, de Holbach makes some interesting points, and he certainly raises important questions about reality and about human choices. However, he doesn't really make a good case for his position. And unfortunately, there are those who still fall back on his position as a defense for a naturalistic, uh, atheistic, closed system where nothing outside of the physical is allowed. In response to this, we have uh, the position held by William James, who I talked to you about the other day, uh, who, who became recognized as the father of modern psychology. He lived in the mid-19th century, so it's a little bit later, you know, 50, 60, 70 years after Baron de Holbach, and uh, lived on into the early 20th century. He became prominent as a philosopher and psychologist, and uh, as I said, he became known as the father of modern psychology, not Sigmund Freud, but William James, and his philosophical worldview included pragmatism, functionalism, stream of consciousness, and radical empiricism. Now, his stream of consciousness is one of the most interesting areas because it affected all of the other areas of the art, of the arts and the sciences. Uh, I mentioned the literature, writers like James Joyce in Ireland with Finnegan's Wake and Ulysses, writers like uh, William Faulkner uh, used some of his techniques in, in some of his writings. Uh, Thomas Wolfe, American author, uh, in his three great works, Time in the River, You Can't Go Home Again, and Look Homeward Angel, all are streams of consciousness kinds of writings. So, um, he had a great influence on explorations concerning how we think and how we communicate. Um, I think probably he raised more questions than he did provide answers. But, you know, that's okay. If you're raising good questions, like Socrates did, uh, that can lead to, to some benefits down the road. Anyway, James claimed that determinism is invalid because the physical universe operates on the basis of random chance. And this is a key point, random chance, which in his view constitutes free actions, his term for it. He defends this view by arguing that the possibility of alternative futures or variations in the future and multiple possible outcomes is legitimate. And I use the example for you of the pickup sticks. And it's a powerful argument unless you begin to think about unseen forces and the effects they could have. When you drop those pickup sticks, it looks like they all fall out in a random uh, pa pattern. Actually, there's no pattern there at all. They just randomly cover the table. But there are forces at work. The velocity, the distance, the uh, force that is, is applied upon them. Maybe other factors that we're not aware of uh, as well that cause those sticks to fall, to land, and to arrange themselves in a particular fashion. The point being, just because something looks random and unplanned to us doesn't mean that it is random and unplanned. It may be... Uh, highly intricate and the planning may be highly complex because of the numerous factors or variables that contribute to that arrangement. So while patterns uh, may not be aesthetically pleasing to our eyes and to our sensibilities, the patterns may yet be there just different than what we might have anticipated. 
So, James, however, maintains that since things have this appearance of randomness and chaos, anarchy, and that certainly there are possibilities of other arrangements, this proves his point. Well, he argues that reality is fluid rather than fixed. Instead of a direct and fixed cause and effect relationship, the components of reality interact in, in a variety of ways. Well, this is a little bit like what I was talking about with variables. However, when you have a set number of variables interacting together in a set context, you do not get alternative multiple outcomes. You only get one. When you drop those pickup sticks, you don't get multiple outcomes. You get one outcome. Because the variables, even though they are varied and multiple, are interrelated in such a way they produce that one thing. So that's important to understand as well, and I don't think William James really responds to that concept very well. Uh, his argument concerning randomness, randomness and chance are the basis of his rejection of determinism and his defense of indeterminism. While I agree with him that hard determinism does need to be rejected, I just don't think he, he makes his case as well as he could. So, he concludes that free will is real and exists. And his position may be succinctly summed up as, since indeterminism is true, free will is valid and real. Now, that's a legitimate argument. But again, how he defends that argument is problematic. He asserts that randomness and chance explain how the universe and human behavior works. But he fails to provide compelling logic, reason, and evidence to support that, in fact, those that randomness and chance are. Actually, he appeals to the appearance of things to make his case. The appearance of things to him. Now, we all know that things can appear one way, and we can find out that it's actually something entirely different. This is the entire nature of optical illusion, and I'm sure you've seen artists create optical illusion uh, you know, visuals that look like one thing, and as you study them, something else begins to emerge. Well, the appearance of things doesn't establish certainty about uh, what the thing is or uh, uh, doesn't provide the kind of proof to make sweeping statements about the nature of reality. We need more than the appearance of something. We need some basis for saying that which appears to be a certain way actually is that way. And how we get to that is, of course, uh, problematic for humans, but it is not impossible. There are ways to get at it, and we'll talk about some of those as we go along. Anyway, his appearance, or seems to be this way, argument, I think is, is weak. So, he asserts a logical connection between indeterminism and free will that is legitimate. Certainly, indeterminism is necessary for free will to occur. However, it does not itself establish that human volition and conscious uh, choices are real and valid. This is because he takes free will human choices to be actually free at the outset. He doesn't acknowledge that even if things are indeterminate, that human choices fit that category it still could be possible that human choices fall into the category of being fixed and determined, while other things can be indeterminate. And he doesn't really make the case for showing uh, the, the relationship between indeterminism and human free will choices. Okay, so our next area that we want to look at is compatibilism. And the appeal here is that there is a way to reconcile determinism and free will which can resolve the apparent incompatibilities between the two perspectives. Now, of course, you can't resolve them if you have radical free will and you have hard determinism. So there has to be soft determinism and something less than radical free will in terms of human choice. So, uh, we'll begin by looking at a philosopher we looked at in the past before, uh, John Locke, who exerted... Uh, significant influence on the founding of the United States of America with his two treatises on civil government. Uh, but we're going to look at him from his 
perspective of how knowledge occurs and how humans come to the place where they can analyze, evaluate, and make choices, uh, which is his most famous concept, and that's his blank slate, tabula rasa viewpoint, that humans are born as a blank slate and life and experience writes on their souls, if you will, uh, in such a way that they take all of that and they make choices in the future based upon all that. But he argues that the choices, that the choices are, in fact, real. So let's talk a little about his background. He precedes Baron de Holbach by about 100 years. Uh, he lived in the 1600s, died in 1704, and is considered one of the most influential thinkers of the Enlightenment. He's been identified as the father of liberalism, but not liberalism in the sense, again, of our current progressive liberal politics in this country, but liberalism in the classical sense, in the sense of uh, true freedom of thought and inquiry and self-determination. And that's a different concept, so I just want to clarify that for you. He was also one of the most significant voices concerning the social contract. Now, you may remember that Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the author of the social contract and did much to talk about that, and did so from a humanistic perspective. Uh, Locke is a little bit different than this, but Locke's journey concerning his own philosophy is quite interesting, so I want to share a little of that with you. Early on, his religious perspectives and his philosophical views were Calvinistic Trinitarianism. And later, uh, he seems to have abandoned this in favor of another viewpoint known as Socianism. Uh, Socianism came from a couple of Italian uh, philosophers and religious thinkers, and basically Socianism was a rejection of the Trinity, a rejection of the divinity of Christ, and a rejection of the atoning work of Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. So basically Socianism was a counter viewpoint to what most people would call orthodox biblical Christianity. And this is a major shift that John Locke made. Now, one of the reasons he made this shift was because he felt it was necessary to promote his tabula rasa free will position. This is because hardline Calvinism promoted a view of the sovereignty of God that said that God is absolutely omnipotent about all things, all-powerful, absolutely omniscient about all things, all-knowing, and this means all things, past, present, and future, are already known to God, and therefore those things are determined. They cannot be changed. So all changes that we experience are sort of the illusions of change, but fit into the broader category of the eternal domain where God has already seen and knows everything that's going to happen. Okay? Well, this is a problem for... Uh, John Locke and his tabula rasa free will position, so he rejected Calvinism. One can only wonder what might have happened if he had uh, replaced Calvinism with Lutheranism, because Martin Luther was much more inclined toward the idea of making God's sovereignty and free will compatible. Even more so, the, the theological perspective of Jacob Arminus that then led to the perspectives of people like uh, theologians like uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield were able to reconcile those views in a biblical way that frankly makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, John Locke didn't adopt those views. He adopted a more radical view, and this comes back later in his life to haunt him. But his best-known concept is tabula rasa, and it's the viewpoint that suggests humans are born morally neutral. They experience things in life that inform and shape their nature in terms of both good and evil. While Locke believes in both good and evil, he rejects the idea of original sin. And this is important as well because that would uh, mean that, that humans come into this life already imprinted in some way and that would have an effect on his tabula rasa idea. He had to maintain the blank slate in order for his view to uh, 
you know, to be, be credible and defensible. This perspective asserts that determinism is true in the sense that external causal forces operate in a person's life through human experience. There are things that you don't control, where you're born, who your parents are, and perhaps some of the things that happen to you in life in terms of, for example, uh, uh, natural disasters, earthquakes, you know, uh, hurricanes, things like that. So those things have a tremendous effect on your life, but they're not determined by you. They're not free will choices. They're the effects of other causations. And certainly one wouldn't argue that a hurricane thinks about being a hurricane and makes the choice to be one. So anyway, he says that uh, uh, there are external causal forces that we don't control, but he says free will is manifested as individuals make choices based upon experiences that uh, are possible either because of or in spite of those things that we don't control, but they're truly free choices. They're not determined by the past experiences. We use the past experiences to make choices that determine the future. Locke asserts that free will is dependent upon two things. One, one has the power to do what one wants or to make a choice, and that makes good sense. If you don't have the power to choose, you can't choose. And two, nothing stands as a barrier to completing the action resulting from the choice. For example, if you want to uh, make a glass of iced tea, you can say, I choose to make a glass of iced tea. But if there's a barrier to you completing that action, it doesn't matter what choice you make. You won't have the glass of iced tea. Barrier, for example, might be there's no glasses, there's no tea. So you can't make one. Anyway, Locke argues that even if determinism is true, it doesn't cancel out free will. This is, he says, because the individual could have done other than what he did if he had wanted to do so. This means that the actual result of choosing is not the consequence of determinism. The operative word in Locke's system is the hypothetical could. He could have done something else. This notion of couldness is upheld by Locke and some of the other compatibilists as proof that free will is valid. Now let's take a few moments to analyze and evaluate Locke's perspective. There are again some problems in his position that arise from uh, philosophical presuppositions which are asserted but not proven. First of all, he fails to establish that tabula rasa is the human condition at birth. And if he's wrong about that, then the ideas of grace and original sin that is, being born with a spiritual nature in the image of God, but also having your spiritual nature corrupted by uh, the disease of sin that is entered into humanity and is transmitted uh, via procreation. If that view is true and plausible, then Locke's entire structure, framework, collapses because he has to have tabula rasa to make it work. I would point out at this point that uh, with grace and original sin, you can still make a strong case for free will being legitimate. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, second, Locke's departure from tra traditional Orthodox Biblical Christian theology in favor of Socinianism dramatically shifts his perspective, as it would for anyone. Remember, our presuppositions drive what we think and do next, and they lead to logical consequences, and outcomes. So he rejects the Trinity, the pre-incarnation existence of Jesus Christ, Christian soteriology, that's a fancy word for uh, the idea of substitutionary atonement through the passion of Christ, that Jesus died on the cross uh, and suffered for the sins of humanity and to save people from that disease and then uh, died, was buried, and rose from the dead in a glorified form that he promises to all those who uh, place their faith and trust in him. But he rejected all of that, but he doesn't offer compelling refutations of these doctrines. He simply chooses to dismiss these because they don't fit in well with his tabula rasa view. Uh, dare I say, he found orthodox biblical Christianity incompatible he, ex he seems to accept Socianism for two reasons. 
He erroneously assumes that science and Enlightenment thinking support this perspective and that biblical Christianity does not do so. This shift in perspective is more compatible with his tabula rasa position. <clears throat> of course, as I've told you in the past, this was hardly the consensus. Uh, in fact, there were strong uh, biblical arguments from learned men, from true intellectuals and academics from the Enlightenment forward who made the case that the biblical position really aligns itself with what we see in terms of practical reality in human behavior uh, better than any other viewpoint. But he ignores this because this is, poses a challenge and a problem for his tabula rasa uh, viewpoint. Locke also asserts that determinism, even if it's true, doesn't eliminate free will. Again, he doesn't offer logic, reason, or evidence to make his position convincing. He just makes this assertion. <clears throat> he asserts that if one could hypothetically choose something different from what one has chosen, then the possibility proves that free will is valid, even if the actual outcome has been determined. This is problematic for a couple of reasons. First, the hypothetical possibility of choosing something other than what one has chosen or what has resulted is not the same as the actual reality of choosing the other. Free will must be more than wishful thinking. It must involve real capability. Otherwise, the choice is not a real choice at all. Rather, it's like saying, if I can imagine a reality other than the one that resulted, then the reality that I imagined is an actual one and is as real as the one that I actually chose that I'm now living. Well, when you really break that down and look at it, that makes no sense. It's not real. It's something you imagine. And we're back to Anselm and the, the difference between conceivability and imagination. Even if Locke's argument concerning goodness is valid, it doesn't logically follow that this proves free will. Instead, the actual reality may be the result of deterministic forces and the couldn'tness scenario may be also be the result of deterministic forces. For example, you choose something because you have no choice. You have to choose that. But at the same time, you imagine you could have chosen something else because you have no choice. You have to imagine that. So he needs to do a better job of illustrating and defending why choices are valid and true. I think there's a way to do that. I just don't think he does a good job of it. Compatibilism must find a better way of reconciling deterministic forces with volition and free will. This necessarily involves clarifying what deterministic forces entail and what human volition allows for. Next, I would like to talk for a few minutes with you about the position held by uh, Walter Terence Stace, W.T. Stace in your textbook. He was a British philosopher who lived in the late 19th century until the mid-20th century. Philosophically, he was a Hegelian romantic idealist. You remember Hegel and the triad. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and of course the process begins, it goes on and on, always ascending to higher levels of truth, always resulting in change that is progressive or good. This is Hegel's basic position. Well, Stace was an uh, admirer of Hegel and his romantic idealism, and he proceeds then to uh, apply principles of mysticism as an epistemological system linked to Hegelian thought. He followed Hegelian reasoning concerning progress and change, emphasizing more moral and cultural relativism. He advocated a form of radical empiricism that he called phenomenalism. This is not to be confused with phenomenology, all right? Through which he attempts to outline the logical steps and processes of the mind as a way of explaining how subjective experience can translate into a justifiable belief in the external world. He attempted to establish a basis for knowledge and morality apart from God and the Bible, because he erroneously concluded that science, once again, had refuted Aquinas' teleological arguments favoring the existence of God. He was, of course, wrong. I've shown you that, that Aquinas has not been refuted, uh, and the refutations are really poor arguments. Anyway, 
As a result, he embraced mysticism and moral relativism as a basis for understanding human behavior and choice. He asserts that all human actions whether or not they are freely done, are either completely determined by causes or at least determined as much as other natural events. Therefore, he concludes that free will cannot be accurately understood as actions which are either uncaused or which are undetermined by other causes. So where does that leave us? Well, according to Stace, there are two kinds of human actions, what he rather arbitrarily identifies as free and unfree. And of course, this is very Hegelian. Thesis, antithesis. Free actions are those which are caused by desires, motives, psychological states of mind, which he references as internal processes. Unfree actions are those resulting from physical forces and physical conditions external to the agent. So, you have these internal uh, processes that lead to choices that he views as free actions. You have external forces that push a person a certain direction that are not about choices, but uh, which he calls unfree actions. And of course, as these operate in a Hegelian system, they synthesize into something that's sort of a combination of internal processes and external forces that lead to outcomes. So, what do we find when we apply analysis and evaluation to W.T. Stace's philosophical perspective? Well, once again, those philosophical presuppositions loom large. First, he erroneously presumes that science has refuted metaphysics in the existence of God. How many times have I run into that false assumption? It's not enough to just say it, you have to show that it makes the most sense using reason, logic, and evidence, which he fails to do. Regardless, along with his viewpoint comes the necessity of rejecting the special status of humanity as created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. He cannot allow for that special status for humans once he eliminates God, because there is no God for us to be created in his image. Second, Stace presumes that truth and reality is entirely empirical, that all human experience and behavior may be understood and explained through empirical means. Stace embraces his phenomenalism, which claims that reality is solely a matter of sensory perception. Therefore, external objects and ideas have no reality beyond one's sensory experiences, which are, of course, empirical and subjective. Now this is different from phenomenology, which is uh, the idea that phenomena can be experienced through the senses and it's actual objective reality. Phenomenalism is perception, uh, so that we perceive things and the what we perceive is uh, what we assume to be reality, but it's not the reality itself. Therefore, his philosophical presuppositions lead to the idea that truth and reality are merely perspectives resulting from sensory experiences and sensory perceptions. Philosophically, phenomenalism and perspectivism operate as the two sides of the same philosophical coin. A circular fallacy immediately arises, as stated. Truth and reality are relative since they are based on individual subjective sensory perceptions. Individual subjective sensory perceptions are the basis of truth and reality. Therefore, truth and reality are relative. Stace fails to establish that phenomenalism is in fact the basis for truth and reality. In addition, resorting to the inductive circular fallacy as a means for proving this position flatly fails to do the job. Third, he asserts that all actions are determined, but that some actions are free and others are unfree, depending on their origination, whether they are internal processes or external forces. By embracing Hegelian romantic idealism, Stace is compelled to accept relativism in terms of the nature of reality 
the nature of truth, the nature of, of morality, and human behavior. When he rejects the idea that external, objective, immutable truth, as revealed by God, the superlative being, that this, in fact, can exist, he can do nothing more than argue his position concerning free will and determinism on circular humanistic grounds. After all, if everything is a matter of perception, then even his own philosophical system is a system based upon his sensory perceptions, which are not, in fact, reality. Again, he fails to acknowledge this and, and uh, make a sound case for why it could be otherwise. Stace doesn't provide a compelling case for rejecting metaphysical reality, most particularly the existence of God and God's truth. He simply asserts and then relies on science to make his case, which science has not done. And once again, Stace makes the shift philosophically from true science into scientism. This being the case, Stace also fails to compellingly make an argument that can be defended for empiricism as the basis for explaining human nature, natural processes, and human choices. Concerning the treatment of free versus unfree actions, Stace commits the error of equivocation, resulting in fallacious reasoning and erroneous conclusions. He arbitrarily redefines free will as one of two determined actions or results. Either the actions are determined by internal forces processes, which he labels as free, or they're determined by external forces and processes, which he labels unfree. The reality is that, in either case, neither of the actions is truly free, since both are really determined by other forces. It doesn't matter if they're inside or outside. The term switching here does not prove the validity of his position. The final viewpoint I would like to uh, present for this lecture involving compatibilism is a position held by William L. Rowe. Uh, William Leonard Rowe was born on July 26, 1931, and on August 22, 2015, he died at the age of 84. This is important because of uh, so many things that have happened in the past 30 to 40 years of which he should have been aware and which should have, had he been open and willing, shifted his viewpoint. Uh, certainly, uh, this is true of Anthony Flew, the uh, atheist who became a theist that I mentioned to you. And if you want to hear more about his thinking and why he shifted, you can read his book, There is a God. But uh, William Rowe didn't make this transition, and I think there are some personal reasons why he didn't. And of course, we have to be cautious when we allow our subjective experiences whether they're good or bad, to be the sole basis for deciding what truth and reality means in an objective, ultimate sense. Sometimes we have to just stop and think for a moment, take a deep breath, you know, breathe out, breathe in, breathe in, stay calm, and ask ourselves, what is truth and reality, regardless of how we feel about it, or regardless of what some individual experience may have made us feel about it? Well, back to Rowe. He became an evangelical Christian during his teenage years. And, of course, this would have been uh, the 1940s. He uh, decided to become a minister. He felt called to be a minister, and he eventually enrolled at Detroit Bible Institute for his collegiate education. He became disgruntled, however. He was disenchanted while there, over the firing of one of his professors for theological views that were not held by the administration of the college. Now, while this may be a legitimate point, it may have been unfair to fire this professor. At the same time, they may have had legitimate grounds. For example, if you agree to wear uh, a suit and a tie to your job at a bank, and then you refuse to do that, you might find yourself receiving walking papers, being terminated, getting fired. Uh, your argument that that's unfair is not legitimate if you signed a contractual agreement that you would honor this requirement from the company. So I don't know for sure what the, the case was in the firing of this professor. It may have been legitimate. It may not have been. I'm not going to comment on that. The point is, though, it bothered William Rowe and bothered him so much that uh, he decided to change his course and find a major that was closer 
to uh, what he wanted to do. So he rejected the uh, theological and political route. He felt that the college itself had become too political. And he shifts his uh, major from theology to philosophy. And of course, this shifts the course of his life as well because he's no longer feeling called to go into the ministry. He then transferred to Wayne State University. While he's at Wayne State, he uh, reported that one particular professor whose father was a minister, but the professor himself had become an atheist, had a remarkable influence on Roe during that time. After his graduation from Wayne State, Roe began his postgraduate education at Chicago Theological Seminary. And this is very ironic. How so? Well, Roe has shifted from a being an evangelical Bible-believing Christian as a teenager to rejecting that while in college to shift to philosophy as a major and then transferring to an institution where he becomes greatly influenced by an atheist who had a background in Christianity from his own father and then Roe ironically decides to do his uh, postgraduate work at Chicago Theological Seminary. Well, it is at this time that he adopted the modern deconstructionist approach toward the Bible. Now, the modern deconstructionist approach came out of uh, Europe and some German theologians uh, like Rudolf Boltmann who decided that science could analyze and evaluate all of the supernatural stories or events in the Bible and determine whether they were actual and real or whether they were fabricated and made up. The result of this was a demythologizing of the Bible that Boltman uh, promoted and a great following came out of that in higher learning institutions, both secular and sacred, both colleges that were not Bible colleges, but colleges that were Bible colleges and seminaries. So the influence was immense by the uh, middle of the 20th century. I would point out that the demythologizing approach was never founded on good, good academic inquiry, good biblical hermeneutics, or uh, scientific analysis. It was rather a philosophical system that began with the presupposition that supernatural things are highly suspect and probably made up and false because those things just don't happen. And therefore, we can read the Bible and take out all of those things as fabrications. Fabrications being a polite word for saying the writers made it up and they lied to us. Uh, however, there is really good evidence going back to the time of both events in the Old Testament and the New Testament that is quite compelling for anyone who has an open mind and wants to look at it. Okay, it's not ultimate 100% proof, but it's very compelling that things greater than just natural forces might exist and might be in operation. So I would encourage you to keep an open mind and look into some of those things uh, as you explore these ideas. But anyway, uh, the demythologizing deconstruction movement uh, moved forward and had a tremendous impact on a lot of young people, a whole generation of young people, in their views of God and the Bible from uh, the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, all the way into the present time. In particular, this came back again in the 1990s with a movement uh, or, or a, uh, the promotion of an interpretation of the Bible called the Jesus Seminar. I don't have time to go into that to, in great detail uh, with you here, but scholars such as John Croissant uh, proposed to read the Bible as a group. There were a handful of these scholars that were handpicked to do this, and they would read passages from the Bible and decide whether those passages were credible and legitimate or whether they were made up and phony. And the way they determined that was they would drop a white marble or a black marble into a, a jar, and the white marble meant legitimate, the black marble meant not, and of course, it was, uh, this was done somewhat anonymously, so there was no accountability whatsoever. There was neither any scholarship or what I would call true academic hermeneutics or exposition of the Bible and the external evidence surrounding the Bible to make the case. 
these men simply read, men and women, they weren't all men, simply read the text and decided what they wanted to agree with and what they didn't, and then just voted. And then they put out their findings, which, of course, the, uh, the media ran with as a, some kind of tremendous proof of what was true and what wasn't true in the Bible. Really, the Jesus Seminar has been just laughed off and totally ridiculed and debunked by really good academic scholars who recognize this is not the way you go about proving things in the Bible. Even scholars who don't necessarily agree with all the supernatural in the Bible, but they do agree in terms of what uh, the standards of academics should be. Anyway, having said that, this was a viewpoint that Roe chose to adopt. In doing so, he rejects the Bible and he rejects the supernatural in the Bible. The result is a new perspective that expresses his rejection of fundamentalist beliefs as he saw them. He describes his conversion from Christian fundamentalism to ultimately atheism, but he says it was a gradual process. So he goes in the exact opposite direction as, as Anthony Flew, who went from atheism gradually to theism. Roe goes from theism gradually to atheism. He said that his examination of the origins of the Bible caused him to doubt its being divine in nature, and that he began to look and pray for signs of the existence of God. And here's a quote. But in the end, I had no more sense of the presence of God than I had before my evangelical conversion experience. So it was the absence of religious experiences of the, of the appropriate kind that left me free to seriously explore the grounds for disbelief, end quote. However, Roe proceeds to introduce a concept that I find quite strange in a way from a logical and philosophical standpoint. And it's a concept that he referred to as the, quote, friendly atheist. In his classic paper on the argument from evil, he makes this position that atheists, while they're correct, and theists, and especially uh, Bible-believing Christians, are mistaken and wrong, that friendly atheists should allow that it's okay for uh, conservative Christians to believe in the Bible and God because it's open-minded and makes, them, makes those people feel better about it. But this is a problem because it begs the entire question of what is truth. And my dad used to always say, son, what do you have if you don't have truth? And his answer to me was, whatever it is, son, it's not the truth. It's false. Now, if you're a person that doesn't mind living a false life based on false things, that won't bother you. But if you're a person who wants to know what things are true and real so that you can order your life around things that are true and real, that position proposed by Roe just won't satisfy. Anyway, he makes that argument. A friendly atheist is a person who accepts that some theists are justified in believing in God even if the case that God exist, doesn't exist is the true viewpoint. You can only imagine why this would be legitimate. Why is it okay to allow people to believe something that's absolutely false and something as important as whether or not God exists? I mean, right now in uh, Israel, there's a war going on that is a religious war. Make no mistake about it. Hamas, Islam, and Israel are incompatible. And they're incompatible going back for centuries, certainly back to around six to 700 AD when Islam started. But even further than that, if you trace the roots back to the time of Abraham, you're back to the time of 1500 to 1800 BC. That's almost 4,000 years ago. That's a long time. And this is a religious, spiritual conflict. So it's just not okay to say, well, it doesn't really matter what the truth is. If people want to believe something, that's okay. If the truth could ever be presented and resolved in the case of Islam, Judaism and Christianity, 
a lot of fighting, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of violence, a lot of war, a lot of death would end. So the question would be, what is the truth and why does it matter? Well, that's something for you to think about and we can look at that another day. Back to William Rowe. One of the things that Rowe's philosophical friendliness, his concept of the friendly atheist, uh, is based on is his adherence to what he calls the principle of charity. But you know, charity is uh, the word that, that in uh, the Bible is derived from two concept, concepts, caritas, which means grace, and agape, which means unselfish love or goodwill toward another, regardless of how you feel about it. So it's interesting that he adopts the principle of charity I think precisely from his biblical upbringing and background as a Christian, but then he wants to apply this concept to his atheistic viewpoint. Now, while I would say it's fine for atheists to want to be charitable, to want to express unselfish love, and in fact, they may be able to do so on occasions. But the question is, what makes unconditional love the best thing ultimately in every case? And how do you know it's the best thing? That must come from a source greater than the individual. And this is uh, Rowe's problem. I feel he should have known better because of his background and because of the many things that happened in the past 40, 50 years or so uh, that have verified and supported the view that the Bible is, is trustworthy, credible, and uh, reliable. Anyway, Real freedom involves power, power over the will and the power to act. Well, according to Rowe, Locke's view of free will fails to meet this requirement. He argues that Locke's perspective involves only action carried out and ignores the importance of the agent of action being able to will to do that action. So in a way, he kind of splits hairs. He says there, uh, that John Locke's act of will has to be caused by a will that is greater than the act of will. So he puts a uh, will mechanism or agent behind John Locke's free will, as though somehow that's going to resolve the problem of what is free will. In a way, that's a little bit like saying God created the universe, but there has to be a God greater than God who created God to create the universe. That becomes nonsensical re reasoning. And if you remember Kalam's uh, argument, cosmological argument, he makes a potent case that this is all nonsense, that there has to be a genuine first cause. Doesn't matter if you call it Locke's free will or the will behind Locke's free will, because you could also add another will behind the will behind Locke's free will, and that can become ad nauseum. So uh, that viewpoint is, is just not, I think, a very good legitimate viewpoint. Anyway, the power to choose ha is essential. Of course, if there's no real power to choose, you can't have free will. So let's do a little analysis and evaluation. I've already done some of that, but of William Rowe's philosophical perspective. <clears throat> His conclusion that the Bible is not authoritative in matters of truth and reality and the correlative conclusion that God doesn't exist is founded upon his presuppositional position concerning God, the Bible, and primarily his own subjective experiences uh, that were negative concerning the Bible and Christian faith. He accepts that the modern deconstructionist approach to the Bible is superior to other forms of hermeneutics. This viewpoint is based on the presupposition that the modernist approach to hermeneutical analysis is more scientific and intellectual than the traditional orthodox approaches. Now, uh, in fairness to Rowe, there was a period of time in the 20th century where there were a lot of questions about evidence, logic, reasoning concerning uh, the reliability, credibility of the Bible, the factual uh, nature of the stories in the Bible. That's largely disappeared. The question now is not, is there evidence to support it? The question is, what does this evidence mean? In fact, 
if these stories are true and real, what does that suggest for us about what we should believe concerning God, humans, human nature, human behavior? And this is where Roe ignores this immense amount of evidence that has been uncovered in the past 40, 50 years. So, he maintains this viewpoint in spite of new information. And I see that as a problem. The irony for uh, Roe is that his viewpoint has been shown to be less scientific and less intellectual based on logic, reason, and evidence, which is pretty overwhelming in the fields of physics, archaeology, historical analysis, textual manuscript artifacts, which have all served to reveal over the past now 70 years the validity, credibility, reliability of the Bible and the stories that are presented there. He seems to have ignored or dismissed all of this information and evidence, starting with the tremendous amount of material found in 1948 in the Qumran caves around the Dead Sea. What you may have heard referenced is the Dead Sea Scrolls. I might mention here, very interesting, that we have one of the top scholars in the world in biblical hermeneutics and biblical uh, manuscript translation, and his name, right here in Springfield, his name is Wave Nunley. He has actually been on the committee that was responsible for translating the original Dead Sea Scrolls. He spent extensive amount, uh, an extensive amount of time in the Middle East, in, your, in uh, Israel, and he and his family just got back after this recent attack. Fortunately, they were able to be taken out of the uh, conflict and returned safely to Springfield, Missouri. And I heard him in an interview just a couple of weeks ago. But he is also involved in this new discovery of manuscripts in the same part of the world, in the Dead Sea region, which is even larger than the original Dead Sea Scrolls. And he's a part of that uh, academic uh, enterprise as well. So right here in Springfield, we have one of the top guys, and he would tell you exactly what I'm telling you uh, about the reliability and validity of the Bible based upon actual evidence. But anyway, back to, to William Rowe. Uh, William Rowe lived long enough. He died in 2015. He lived long enough to be aware of a lot of this material. Now, not the new material, which was found more recently, but he was certainly uh, able to, to access a lot of the archaeological finds from the 1980s, late 80s, 1990s forward, uh, like Gilgal Rephaim, the Great Serpent Mound, adjacent to Gilgal Rephaim in the Middle East, and some of these other sites that you've heard me talk about. But uh, also the material found in the Dead Sea, sea Scrolls that is, is remarkable in terms of uh, the amount of evidence, but also what that evidence has, has shown us over the past 70 years. So he, he could have had access to that, and that might have influenced his viewpoint. We'll never know because, for whatever reason, he didn't do that. He just seems to have ignored or dismissed all of that information. Anyway, as a consequence, the primary conclusions derived from his presuppositions <clears throat> require from him additional secondary conclusions, but they also pose problems for his system. He can't effectively argue truth and morality in the philosophical vacuum produced by the absence of God and higher truth. Simply put, what does he base truth and morality upon? Where does it come from, and how do you know it? Second, he attempts to maintain the realities of good and evil while denying any external legitimate standard for them. Again, uh, this is not plausible. It's not credible. It's not a compelling position. Third, his friendly atheism, which he bases on the principle of charity, or love and kindness, is problematic. He argues that out of charity, atheists should grant Christians their belief in God, saying that their belief is justified even if God doesn't exist. Their faith should be supported. Well, this is tantamount to suggesting that someone is justified in believing a lie so long as the lie gives him comfort, is sincere, and makes someone more content. But what if, what if affirming someone in that lie causes them to behave in such a way that makes life worse for those around them? 
then this is not a good thing. And one could call into question the entire argument that this is a uh, demonstration of love and kindness. The better position is to accept that truth and reality are the most important things. And that it's always better to tell people the truth than it is to affirm them in something that is false. So we'll stop this lecture here. And uh, I hope that some of the things that were said here caused you to think a little bit. I hope you found them interesting and intriguing. Hope also you found some of the things that uh, we, I hope that also some of the things that we shared together during this session uh, are, are things that you will carry with you beyond this course into your life that will be a benefit and use to you uh, as you form relationships and that these will serve you well in helping your life become one of uh, fulfillment and joy. And I look forward to seeing you in the next class session. I'm sorry I had to miss the previous session, but I was really not feeling very well at all, but I'm doing better now. So I look forward to seeing you in class. Just remember what I like to tell you. Be safe, be kind, and remember that uh, I want the best for all of you.